Okay, so with that said, let's jump into Revelation, I mean uh, Hebrews. <laughs> Hebrews, uh, we're going to go at the 10th chapter. We've been, we're doing a resurrection life series. We're the fourth week into it. We did the first week on Jesus Christ, our resurrection and life. Then we've gone into Jesus Christ, our high priest. And this is the third week of doing that. Next week, we're going to look at what does revelation, what, what, what are the possibilities of resurrected life looking like? So, and we're not going to work with what we currently are seeing, but we're going to let the scripture expand our imagination to the, to the extent of what resurrection life will look like, whether it's been seen yet, but it's in the Bible. And it's just going to kind of let our, our imagination expand and our faith increase. And then the last week, the 11th, will be Yom Kippur, uh, which is the Day of Atonement. And we are going to rock out and celebrate Jesus, our high priest. I mean, we're going to just, we're going to have so much faith for what he's accomplished once for all that it's going to like be everything that we know about him today, yesterday, and forever. He's going to hit the moment, go in the past, and go into the future, and we're going to have the, ability, the faith to, to, to ascribe to him what he has actually done. So I'm really thrilled. Then the following week, it's the 19th, and boom, we're in Resurrection Life Conference. If you haven't registered, go online, please. If you're online and you haven't registered, go on. you're online already. Just continue on and register. We want to pray for you. We want you to uh, mark, place it in your calendar. We are going to be adding like eight workshops in the afternoon that are all going to open doors in specific ways where you will, you'll feel like, oh, I want to go over there. I want to have that activated. It uh, starts Wednesday night, all day Thursday, all day, all day Friday, and closes in the afternoon on Saturday. So, and then tomorrow night we're doing Resurrection Prayer, which is flowing in this uh, series of uh, teachings to pray and, and uh, explore. To boldly go where no man's gone before. Find your way there in prayer. So I can't repeat what I've done, but I will say that chapter 7 introduces a new high priest. Jesus under the order of Melchizedek. We read a portion of that. Chapter 8 introduces a new covenant. With a new priest comes a new covenant. If there's an old priest that's done away with, therefore the old covenant is passed away too. And now it speaks of the better covenant, better promise, better hope. And then chapter 9 goes to a better sacrifice because if there's a new priest and a new covenant, there must be a new sacrifice. The sacrifice, the shedding of blood, is what... Uh, inaugurates a covenant as well as uh, when a testament is written or a, uh, a will is written, it does not go into force until the one who wrote it is dead. Otherwise, it's, um, he could always change it, the one who's living. But the, once it's been um, the, the, test, the, the writer of the New Testament, Jesus, the, the author of this new covenant, he was killed, he was offered as a sacrifice, his shedding of his blood was the better sacrifice. And so in uh, Hebrews, I'm going to use my Bible, Sam, and just, I'll try to tell you where I am so we can read up. But Hebrews, I'm going to show you this real simple Hebrews 7. We're going to get through at least 9, uh, 10, and 11, and I hopefully 12. So in chapter 9, Verse 23, and I want to just kind of catch up. Therefore, it was necessary that the copies of the things in the heavens should be purified with these, but the heavenly things themselves should be better sacrifices. So all the tabernacles, all the temple, all these prescribed fashions of worship were, were sanctified by blood, bulls, goats, lambs, so forth. But... The, but heaven itself had to be sanctified by uh, something better, a better sacrifice. For Christ has not entered the holy places made with hands. He never went into the temple inside the Holy of Holies. He never conducted a, a portion of service there. But which are the copies of the true, but into heaven itself now to appear in the presence of God for us, which is his current posture as high priest. That word appearance means to exhibit himself and to disclose himself through words. He is like holding a, 
uh, an eternal place that has been provided for us by his sacrifice and who he is as high priest, to which we are learning to fellowship there. That's the place we want to learn to relate and know God. Not that he should offer himself often as the high priest enters the most holy place every year without, with blood of another. He then would have had to suffer often since the foundation of the world, but now once at the end of the age he has appeared to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. That word is the first appearance which we are historically know, his death, his burial, and his resurrection. That appearance is that it's apparent. It is, it's, it's, it's something to which we, 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 we all can point to it. It's there, it's been seen, and it's real. So he says, and it is appointed for men to die once, but after that the judgment. So Christ was offered once to bear the sins of many. To those who eagerly wait for him, that's you and me, he will appear a second time. That's the next advent. He comes through the skies on the horse with us with. He'll appear apart from sin. He will not have any relationship to sin. Sin will have been a past issue but he'll be appearing in the fullness of salvation, which is a huge thought. So now we go into chapter 10, which is kind of like, let's review what we've just look, been looking at for nine chapters. For the law, verse 1 of chapter 10, for the law having a sat shadow of the good things to come. The word shadow is used often in the New Testament to refer to something that, that was introduced before, but was was a pointing to, and it always points to Jesus as the real deal. The shadow is something that's cast by something that's real. And so the shadow of the good things to come, and not the very image of the things, can never with the same sacrifices which they offer continually, year by year, make those who approach perfect. Whenever you read the word perfect, nine times out of ten in the New Testament, the word perfect would be better translated complete. Complete. So uh, for then they would have ceased to be offered. So if I brought an offering to the Lord to pay for my sins and it, there was, there was un, it was completely undone, then I shouldn't have to return next year. There should be some point where this stops. This shouldn't keep recycling. For the worshipers once purified, now here's the key, would have no more consciousness of sins which is an old, test, old term we used to call a sin consciousness or righteousness consciousness. To conscious is a co-knowing. It's the knowledge you have that God has that you both have of yourself. Now you and I have been in times where we've had something going on in our life that nobody else knows about, but we know God knows about it. And maybe we struggle with it for a season. Maybe we, deal, we ignore it. Maybe we drown it. Maybe we don't want to have a deal with it. But, but that's your conscience. That's that knowledge you have when you go to bed and when you wake up, the, the, the knowing. And it's co-knowledge because God has that knowledge. Now, can you imagine having the knowledge that God, know, God has so cleansed, purged, and removed sin that it's no longer in your conscience? That's what he's introducing the better sacrifice brought. For in those sacrifices, a reminder of sins every year. Verse 4. Uh, for it is not possible that the blood of bulls and goats should take away sins. It would cover sin. It would atone for sin. It would allow sin to be uh, passed over. But it would not erase sin, eradicate sin, expunge sin. Therefore, when he came into the world, he said, Sacrifice an offering you did not desire but a body you have prepared for me. There's a huge teaching on that word body. But let's go on. In burnt offerings and sacrifices for sin, you had no pleasure. In other words, it's, it, it'd, be like a, you know, it'd be like a dad and your kids get into debt every year and then you have to pay their debt off. And then they start the next year and they get debt, debt the next year and you've got to pay it off. You're, 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 perpet, you're, 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 you're propitiating a, a state of debt that nobody ever gets free from or lives from because there's no way we could have the sin atoned for by the blood and bulls and goats. So he had no pleasure. I mean, he was glad. He, it was a means for man to have confidence, to approach God and to be assured through the word of God that he was accepted and he was received. But it wasn't for God a happy thing. It wasn't the way he wanted to have relationship. 
Then he said, Behold, I've come, this is Jesus now, in the volume of the book it is written of me to do your will, O God. So here's what Father always wanted. Previously saying, Sacrifice and offerings, burnt offerings, and offerings for sin you did not desire, nor had pleasure in them, which are offered according to the law. Then he said, so he's comparing these two. Sacrifices, behold, I've come to do your will. Then he said, behold, I've come to do your will, O God. He takes away the first, sacrifice and offerings, that he may establish the second, the will of God. By that will, through what Jesus did, that will we have been sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. That's a fun little term, once for all. You find it all kinds of places in Hebrews. This is everything Jesus did. He did once for all, for all time. That's why when we approach the atonement, we're going to celebrate to ascribe to Jesus the, 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 the magnitude of what has been accomplished. Whether we can fully experience it yet or not, we're going to ascribe what he accomplished. And every high priest, every priest stands ministering daily. Offering repeatedly the same sacrifices which can never take away sins. So they don't take them away, they cover them. They make things acceptable, they make God have a, a freedom of relationship, but it isn't resolving the issue. But this man, after he had offered, once, one, offered one sacrifice for sins forever, sat down at the right hand of God. So this man, Jesus... One sacrifice covers Passover, covers Pentecost, covers Sukkot, covers Yom Kippur, bulls, goats, everything, forever. Sin sacrifice, burnt offerings, uh, just everything. And he sat down at the right hand of God from that time waiting till his enemies are made his footstool, which is what we're in the process of the collecting and separating season. The collecting of enemies to be placed un as Jesus' footstool and the separating of all things in Christ unto Christ to God. And that's where we're going to start feeling. And I think we could even feel in the prayer today for, for uh, the ladies that there's just coming an acceleration of change. An acceleration of transformation. So for by one offering he is perfected made complete forever not, not as long as you don't sin forever those who are being sanctified. So yeah, you and I are in learning curves and we're, 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 we're figuring out how to live free and not slaves. And we're learning how to live not with a law telling us how to be, but in a communion and union and uh, likeness, walking in relationship. We're, we're not trying to have a relationship with God through the law. We're having it through faith in, in what Jesus accomplished. So for this one offering, he perfected forever those who are being sanctified, which isn't, it wouldn't, the word being is put in there just to make it easier for us to hear, but it's really for those who are sanctified. You're sanctified by the offering of Jesus Christ, not by what you're doing. You're made holy by the sacrifice of Jesus Christ, not by how you're living. Now you may be not living holy, and it'll catch up on you, and your life won't be as happy anyway, but it isn't making you holy by the way you're living. You're living by being, by what Jesus made. Now, the more we hold, behold what he did, the more we can live what he did. It's, it's the cart before the horse. We become what we behold, and as we behold him, we become what he is. So it's, it's not this like touch not, taste not, handle not, don't do anything that you shouldn't do, be watch out. It's like, oh, I can't believe the vast liberty God has given me to enjoy, the freedom and the delight. And I'd like to get closer into your presence and experience your love even more. I, 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 it's just a totally different direction. One is, one is avoiding, the other is pursuing. Do you understand how that works? It's totally different. And we're free to pursue because we have nothing to avoid. The avoiding issue is dealt with. You make a mistake, Jesus already paid for it. You went and sinned, Jesus already paid for it. You left the you fellowship and departed for God from seven years. Jesus already paid for it. I, there's nothing you've done or will ever do that Jesus didn't already pay for. It's not going to be paid for a second offering. He made one offering for all time to deal with all things. And when we meet God through him, that's how come he saves us to the uttermost. That's how come it's like, 
There's just like no distance. So if you learn that, then we'll, we'll see in a moment, you never practice trying to resolve your issue. You just practice pursuing Jesus. You don't try to get the thing fixed that's broken. You just go to find the one who is whole. You pursue him and everything else will resolve. You try to fix things, you'll be always fixing things. How many of you remember when you were getting, if you were old enough to, to kind of really have a contemplating of surrender to Jesus, that part of your thought was, you know, I want to just get my life together and then I'll give my life to Jesus? You don't do that. You just give him the life the way it is and he makes it perfect. But uh, the Holy Spirit also witnesses to us for after he had said before, and here he's re-quoting Jeremiah 31, 31 through 34, the Holy Spirit also witnessed to us that after he said before, this is the covenant I'll make with them. I will put my laws into their hearts. I'll write them on, in their minds. I'll write them. I'm going to be the one who sets their standard. I'm going to be one to, to call them into their unique life with me, inside of me, knowing me. They're all going to know me. And then he adds. So the Holy Spirit wants to add. How come God do this? How can God just say, oh, forget it. We're gonna, I'm going to know each of you. I'm just going to know you. And nobody else is going to go around teaching each other what does it mean to know God. I'm going to know you. Least, greatest, it doesn't matter. Why? Because the Holy Spirit adds, their sins and their lawless deeds, I will remember no more. Now, the word remember means it's out of your mind. It's put out. So, in the decision of eternity, through the sacrifice of his son, Father said, because he has paid for it and my wrath has paid, been placed on it, I don't have to have a relationship with you in regard to your sin. I can actually put that out of my mind, and I don't even have to ever think about it anymore. So that's why our conscience is purged in regard to sin and made one in regard to being imputed righteous. So the point is, that's total liberty to pursue, to pursue the one who saved us. Now where there is remission, where there, now where there is remission of these, they are no longer an offering for sin. So when we come, and all of the practice of a yielding soul, because that's really what our life is, we're practicing on the planet, to surrender our soul into the hands of a loving father, to allow our soul to no longer control a relationship with God out of fear. To not interpret life through the, the soul's filter that seeks to, say, to save itself and preserve itself. But to abandon ourselves to someone who loves us so great, even if he kills us. And know that even if death comes, it's so that life might manifest. So we're not even, you know, all this like, I just can't handle one more disappointment. We go, oh, whatever. Disappointment is just his appointment. Change one letter and you'll see. You know, it's just, let's go, let's go, let's go, let's go. To, to, to die is gain, to live is Christ. So whichever way, I win. Do you follow me? It just is like this, this, this liberator takes all this slavery mentality, all this, uh, you've got to uh, make sure that you are ascribing to a certain standard for God to bless you to the next region. When all it really is is God to discover Jesus in a new way. He's the door. He's the way. He's the truth. He's the life. Therefore, here we go. Therefore, brethren, having boldness to enter the holiest by the, by the blood of Jesus. By a new and living way which he consecrated for us through the veil that is his flesh. Which is death, burial, resurrection, ascension, intercession. And having a high priest over the house of God. Three eternal um, uh, provisions, blood, the death, the, 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 the sacrifice of Jesus, the offering of Jesus, and now his new, pra- his new place as a high priest. So you could say, we, are, we have boldness to come in by what Jesus has done and by who Jesus has become. What he did, he died for my sins and his blood is my boldness and he, and he conquered and made a pathway for me right into the very holiest of holies. And he meets me there as high priest. Not as savior, but as high priest. As the, uh, as the one who is now continuing a, a relationship of union. The Passover lamb got Israel out of Egypt and it was to be remembered so it could be instilled on that they were delivered 
But, it, but Yom Kippur, atonement, was to, to secure a continuing relationship with the nation. So what Jesus did got me out of my, my sin and my death and my destruction. And what he continues with standing before Father as high priest is how I grow in this unlimited place of relationship. I mean, unlimited. Unlimited. You can't go to God and say, hey, God, can I see some new stuff? No. You haven't earned it. No, you, you're never going to earn it. Just pursue. Just behold. Just worship. So let us draw near now with a true heart. Honesty is in, huge in the kingdom, in the Father's presence. In full assurance of faith. You see, you can be honest about who you are because you can't get kicked out by who you are. Do you understand this? I mean, this is huge. You can tell God, Dad, I am upset. I'm angry. I feel like this. I don't want to do that. I don't think this is it right. I, but he's not going to say, get out of here, you ungrateful son. He'll say, okay. Let's talk about it. Let's have some conversation. Trust me, whenever you have a conversation with God, you've, you've got to be heard out before you hear him. And by the time you hear him, what you had to say was stupid. And you don't care because you're so glad you got the truth come to you. You've got to tell the lie out, what you're feeling, how you're seeing it, what's happened to you, your woes. And then all of a sudden it's, woe is me. You're awesome. I'm so glad we had this conversation. You win. You're right. I trust you again. No problem. Go ahead. Do it again. Because it just, and what happens is two now practical things happen. There's a sprinkling of the evil conscience. So there is a daily cleansing, not of acceptance, but of uh, practice, of enjoyment. Ah, it's like showers, right? We don't take showers. Uh, we don't try to avoid showers. I just hope you don't. We, there's no virtue in saying, it's been six years since I had to take a shower. If that was true, well, none of us would have fellowship with you. Because no, you may not smell, you, we would smell you. So the sprinkling of an evil conscience it's just a, oh, man, thank you, Jesus. That day is gone and gone and gone and gone and by and by and by. And, oh, I feel so fresh and free. And then the washing of the, of the bodies with pure water is how Jesus is making his bride perfect. Right? Washing her with the water of the word. Washing her with the water of the word. Come on in, honey. Yeah, what happened? It's like a good husband. Okay, so they didn't have the dress you were trying to get. Okay. Well, what does that mean? Yeah, I can understand. You'd be pretty bummed. I'd be, oh, I don't know. Yeah, yeah. You start, you know, just let Jesus will work with you. And then he'll say, hey, well, let me, let me put this on. Let me, let me say these truths. See, God, you, you rarely find Jesus wanting to tell you something until you tell him how you're really doing. But once you do, then he finds a way to correct it, bring it into freedom, truth, washing. And next thing you know, I just love you so much. I don't care if I ever get that dress. I don't need it. You just, I don't ever want it. I don't, all I want is you. Yeah. And now, let us hold fast the confession of our hope. This is intimacy in the, in the kingdom. This is, the, this is the, the purpose of perpetual, eternal life. Hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. The Bible says, when we started in Hebrews 3, it says, he is the apostle and high priest of our confession. And we are the house that he's over. He said he's a high priest over the house, whose house we are. If we hold fast the rejoicing and confidence of hope firm to the end. So when you and I have this encounter, experiential encounter, where you are really are experiencing all that we just read, the only thing left to do is just to bring him back his promises, the things he said and the things he said. And just say, you know what? You are so capable of performing what you promise. You are like so able. It's, it's like, you know, okay, maybe I can't get that dress, but you can get me a hundred more of those dresses. You have so much capability. You have so many connections. You even know who owns the store. You're the boss. You're the... It's just you start expanding the communication of hope which is the war over every soul in this room. Every soul in this room is warred over hope, more than faith and more than love, because if you can take out the hope, the faith and the love will both fall. 
you will, you will doubt the sincerity of the person who made the promise, and you'll begin to doubt the ability of the person who made the promise. So hope is huge. And then he says, so there's, there's three let us. Let us draw near, let us hold fast, and then let us consider one another. So we start, you know, one of us in a, one of us in a good moment of glory cleansing, glory washing, glory experience, glory enjoyment. Seriously, everything has been paid for. The only thing that God, Papa, doesn't get to fully have yet is us. And not because he doesn't own, have rights to us by what he paid for. We are the ransomed. We are the redeemed. We're just not returning. We're still working stuff out, which is okay with him. He's okay to wait. But when we come in and we start to be with him, it's like you turn heaven on. What makes a party start in heaven is a man having a different thought than the one he had the day before. One re sinner repenting makes heaven go into a party. Repentance to have a different thought. I don't need to worry over that. Yeah, somebody just got a hold of the victory is really won. Uh, I don't need to be so angry. Yay, freedom is forgiveness is overtaking. And we experience those emotions. And then once we're doing that and we're drawing near and we're giving God praise and we're agreeing with him, then we're going around going, there's somebody... This, we all got to move this way. We're the bride of Christ. We all got to move into this. So what, what can I do to encourage you to love and good works? How do you, let's keep going, guys. Let's don't stop. And then not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together is a manner of some because as we, people lose their hope. They lose their courage. They lose their reason. But we need to get together even more. To assemble is to collect. To exhort is to draw tighter. We need to exhort because the day's coming. And the day is not going to be easy for everybody as the day comes, but it's going to be the best day that ever came. So you want to stay, get in the presence, get into his presence. Did you get into the high, were you, at the, were you in the holy holies today? Get in there. Let's do it together. For, and then it's, it says that we sin willfully after, and if, after we've received the knowledge of this truth, there's no longer, it's like there's nothing more we can do. It's the only thing we did do, and it's forever done. There's no other, there's not a third covenant coming. But a certain fearful expectation, go to verse 28, because that's not your problem. But no, notice, uh, it says, if anyone, back to con contracting, contrasting covenants, if anyone rejected Moses' laws, they died without mercy. How much more punishment do you suppose will be thought worthy of who trampled the Son of God underfoot, counted the blood of the covenant as an unholy, as a common thing, and insulted the Spirit of grace. This relationship that we've been brought into is so real to Father that if we, if we are really worried about doing something, we don't want to do that. We don't want to, we don't want to consider Jesus less than, any, than everything. And we don't want to look at his blood as something common and of really no consequence. Yeah, sure, you could claim the blood, but have you gone through counseling? Yeah. Counseling is wonderful, but it's not the blood of Jesus. The blood of Jesus trumps everything. The blood of Jesus cleanses consciences. Nothing else does that. And, and to insult the spirit of grace is to say, Holy Spirit, you know, yeah, right. I'm not sure if you're capable of communicating this and bringing it to fruition. Yeah, it's just so... There is an exhortation to say that this superior, better, beautiful, brilliant covenant is something to which we must recognize as God's best and only. And then it goes on, and I don't know how to close this in two minutes. I'm in verse chapter 10. Oh, Lord. Um, he starts again repeating that what we learned in chapter 6 and 5, that really we're, we're embracing something by faith. It's a promise made that we have to believe. And it's based on the belief that God raised Jesus from the dead. If he did, then all this other is possible, not only possible, it is ours. And yet, in the process of believing, we're going to be resisted in circumstances and reasons to, feel, to believe that way. And so we have to keep our endurance alive. And he talks about that, you know, when you first got saved, you, you, you lost everything and could care less. So now stay in that same attitude. Care less. Lose it. Who cares? There's more in heaven than ever I can lose on earth. 
Everything that I ever wanted is now in heaven and secured. And it's just this attitude that makes you an overcomer. An overcomer is not somebody who's a control freak. An overcomer is someone who's a releaser. Well, whatever, whatever. We got it, we got it. Because he's coming. And when he comes, he's bringing everything. His reward is with him. And he's coming to, to, to meet my faith. And I don't want to be uh, trying to uh, hold my place and shrinking back because it's getting too risky. God is risky. He is like, come follow me. Where are we going? I'll tell you when we get there. Is that you, Jesus, walking on the water? If it is, tell me to come. Come. Just come. 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 And if you release yourself, the, the, the unhinging from the law and the unhinging from the past and the unhinging from loss and the unhinging from unforgiveness and the unhinging from self-righteousness beckons you to pursue this God. Then chapter 11 completely substantiates that everything from the beginning of time, from the elders until the last, is all come because of faith. And righteousness is imputed, and pleasure is given, and, and, and arcs are built, and everything is, happens by faith. Faith is the only thing that really is what we're about. And so here we've been given the most humongous promise that's ever come onto the planet, that Jesus Christ is sufficient for all things. His death, burial, resurrection, now his high priestly ministry is our union and communion, and this is our faith. Hold that faith. It's going to be harder than Abraham's journey. Because you're looking, you're really touching the city that's coming, who's builder and maker of God. You're starting to see the new Jerusalem. It's starting to appear. And then chapter 12 expands on this. Going, Guess what, guys? Jesus endured the cross because he saw something. He, he had a tangible connection to joy. I am a firm believer that joy is my strength. And if I lose my joy, I'll lose my strength. I lose my strength, I'll lose my ability to hold my place. So I got to hold joy. I know people say Jesus was looking for the joy and that was you and me getting saved. I think that's true, but that wasn't what kept him on this place. He was in joy. He was in joy. And if you read the Greek, you see that it isn't something he was looking toward obtaining. It was something he was living in and from. So I'm in joy while I'm suffering. And he's in this joy and he breaks through. And then God says, hey, he walked through this. You're going to walk through this. It's, it's called discipline. It's tutoring. It's teaching. It's learning. And you're going to learn in, in, in yielding to come under his voice, just like Jesus came under the Father's voice. You're going to learn to do his will, like Jesus came to do Father's will. And you're going to be tempted to despise your birthright and just choose the fleshly route, like Esau did. But don't do that, because it doesn't work. Instead, we're in this incredible moment. And I'll read, close with this, Hebrews 12:18. For you have not come to the mountain that may be touched and burned with fire and to the blackness and darkness of a tempest. That was back in Mount, uh, uh, Mount, Sinai, Mount, Sinai, Mount Sinai and the sound of a trumpet and the voice of words so that those who heard begged that the words would not be spoken to them anymore. And they should not endure what was commanded for so much a beast touches the mountains it shall be shot with an arrow. Just from the beginning of this, like, well, I can't handle this, I can't handle this. So terrifying was the sight that Moses said, I'm exceedingly afraid and, afraid and trembling. He's seen God in a bad mood. <laughs> but you have come to Mount Zion and to the city of the living God. See, this is how close we are. Why won't we begin to have a greater grasp of the new Jerusalem, the heavenly Jerusalem, to the heavenly Jerusalem, to an innumerable company of angels, to the general assembly and the church of the firstborn who are registered in heaven. Your name's up there. If you've called upon the name of the Lord, your name's up there. You're in a registry. I'm sure it's not a piece of paper. It's just God and light. And the God of the judge of all, to the spirits of just men made perfect, to Jesus, the mediator of the new covenant. We're talking about like, his, we've come into this incredible kingdom family and collective and ongoing expansion and the blood of sprinkling that speaks better than the blood of Abel. See, blood of Abel is the first martyr on the earth and he says, justice, 
justice. I want justice. My blood's crying out for justice. Jesus was the first blood that said forgiveness, 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 forgiveness. And the blood of Jesus speaks better than all of the martyr bloods. That's why he, he trumps it all. See then that you don't refuse him who speaks. So I, I got to close, but now he's saying this thing that we've opened up and opened us into and joined us a part of and to whom we are in a company of witnesses, to whom all of the hall of faith could not be made complete apart from us, to whom we are part of this unfolding experience. And one thing we got to do now is just keep letting him talk to you. Back to, he, back to Hebrews 3. Don't refuse his voice. Let him talk. Let him talk to you. Let him talk to you. If you're discouraged and he wants to encourage you, let him encourage you. If you're having a, a bad attitude and he wants to call you to happiness, get happy. If, he's, if, if, if you're sitting there in doldrums and depression, he says, hey, praise me. Praise him. Uh, respond. Let him give you words. Let him give you voice because he's shaking. He's coming and he's shaking. He's going to shake every single thing, not just in earth, but in heaven, heaven and earth. And we're receiving a kingdom and we're getting the grace to get the kingdom and we're going through this massive transformation. And it's just... Why? This is... This is a glimpse into the conclusion of the age, not the beginning of the age. So we're closer to this outcome than where we started. But like any good movie, the movie starts with promise, goes into the dumps, and then is recovered at the last minute. And that's where we're at, the recovery. We're like, whoa, I see. So let's stand, please. Heavenly Father, you who love us eternally, and have provided for that relationship forever. Have secured us in your son. Purchased and paid for with your own blood. And extinguished all of your wrath upon all sin forever. Have no longer this repetitive uh, offering required. Instead, we have a relationship with you through, our, through your blood. And through your veil. And through the high priest. And here we are able to draw near in honesty with faith, assurance that we are here accepted. We can experience deep conscious cleansing and freedom. We can have expunged from our mind and record of our life things that we have lived with shame all our life can just be in the moment and presence of God and our bodies washed. And then we can come near in praise and thanksgiving with a confession of hope that so says, I don't care how the world looks. My daddy said this, and he's able to do that. And I'm going to hold those promises alive in praise and thanksgiving. And we can come alongside and encourage one another, and find one another, and say, come on, let's run. We're going to win. We all win. We've already won. Let's just run into the winning. And if we lose and we find, fall, who cares? We'll come up and come alive. It's only one plan and only one outcome. Jesus Christ is Lord and we are led in triumph. Let's run together. Let's not back off. And wherever we are looking at the discouragement through the long waiting of the season for breakthrough, we say to one another, don't cast away your confidence. Yes. Hold it alive. He who promised is faithful. He who called you is faithful. He who is, he will come. He will come. He will come. Now the just will live by faith, so don't draw back. Don't let your soul become overwhelmed in sorrow and give up and let go. Press on, press in. Because he who's coming will come, and when he comes, he will bring a reward, and he will find faith, and he'll be pleased. And all of the faith in the years before it are not complete without yours. So we, my pa, our Father waits for our journey, our entry, our pursuit, our following. And we're now coming not to an old mountain that trembled with all of the fire and all the expression of heaven but to the Mount Zion to a new company innumerable angels to the new Jerusalem to a heavenly city to the firstborn registered in heaven to the spirits of just men who have been made perfect to Jesus our mediator of a better covenant and to this glorious blood that speaks better than the blood of Abel and so Lord Daddy we ask you tonight for all of us we want to hear your voice. Help us to hear, to yield, to surrender. You're not coming to condemn us. You're not even coming to try to uh, 
uh, improve us. <laughs> you're coming to free us. And you're liberating us from soulish, soulish ideas and soulish ways. And fleshly control and fleshy com compromise. But it's never with the, the pointing of the finger or the speaking of wickedness. It's with the beckoning to come, follow me. I made you to become something more than you are. So with yes and amen, and we say, Father, we're, we want to follow you. We want to pursue. We want to receive. We, by grace, want to receive the kingdom that's being now given to us in this hour for your glory, that you might be magnified in everything we do. We thank you for this now in Jesus' name. Amen. Whew. Praise the Lord. Thank you, guys. That's probably the fastest I ever went through chapter 11, 12. <laughs>